Welcome back to the wardrobe. And I'm probably looking a little bit rougher than normal. Because when I do these, I used to use Zoom. And it's got this filter on that kind of makes you look like a soft focus thing. Anyway, um, I've decided for this one to go to use Skype. And I know that sounds like going back. Zoom's the thing. Using Skype, isn't that like Ask Jeeves? So I've decided to use Skype because I was never happy with the sound on Zoom. I never thought it was really that clear. And also, the last few of these Zoom casts I was doing, talking to interesting people, the sound came back once I'd recorded. It wasn't synced. So I had to mess about and sync it. So... Instead of getting that sinking feeling, I've tried Skype. And I spoke to somebody great. Her name is Saruti Bala. And she's one of the hosts of Red Handed, which is some podcast. It's it's true crime. It's really gritty crimes that they talk about in a very um well, a very sweary way. And we talk about that and the reason for that. The strange thing is, though, although I obsessed over the technology to use, you know, I'm not happy with Zoom, I'm going to use Skype. Turns out she lives up the road. (laughs) She's like three or four miles away, that's all. It's a crazy world we live in. Anyway, they talk about some of the crazies in the world in their podcast. And... She was great, really, really good fun. And uh, towards the end, we even started talking about local trivia. And although she's lived about three, four miles up the road all her life, and I've only lived here about seven years, I knew something about this general area she didn't know. And it's a biggie. And uh, it's a bit of a surprise. It was a surprise to me when I found out not that long ago, and I managed to surprise her with it. So I hope you enjoy this chat. Um, She was great. The podcast is brilliant. This is Saruti Bala. Congratulations on the award. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, I'm still, I still don't think I've really taken it in in any way. It still feels like such a complete shock that that happened. Uh, Yeah, we're, we're just very grateful, very grateful. Now, it was the, the Listener's Choice Award for, for the podcast Red Handed. So did you campaign and try to get your listeners to vote? Oh, yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely. <Right. laughs> so it wasn't, uh, it was a surprise in that they actually, we actually got as high as we did and we actually got silver place. But yeah, because the first year, because we've been running for about three and a half years now as a podcast and the very first year, Uh, somehow unbelievably we did not campaign we did not think it was a possibility we got into the top 20 of the listeners choice the very first year then last year we were in the top 10 which felt amazing and this year we thought uh, as long as we can stay in the top 10 that would be amazing and to find out we were second in the country was just absolutely mind-blowing so next year gold See yeah, yeah, silver go. this year, next year, gold. Well, if the trend continues, top 20, top 10, silver, gold, it's, it's got to happen. The data doesn't lie. The it's data happen, doesn't lie, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so we'll see. What is a nice girl like you doing talking <sighs> about horrible murders? I mean, Graham, I think nice girls love murder. That's what it is. That's what it comes down to. That's what we've found. That is the red-handed brand. Um, no, I think when you look at true crime in general as a genre, it is majority women who are listening to that category. Is it really? Wow. Absolutely. I can say that confidently, that it is predominantly women um, who are the consumers of the true crime genre, whether it's books, whether it's documentaries, whether it is podcasts. And we have about 80% female listenership, um, which is just which is great because they're the similar age to us. They can relate to us. And I think it's because... I guess in a lot of cases, we are the victims of crime, uh, especially murders and things like that. So I don't know, I think there is some sort of maybe self-preservation. The more I know, the more I can protect myself, the morbid fascination with that, possibly. I don't know. And I also think it's because it is just such, we as 
we approach it anyway as a very like uh, intellectual pursuit. It's a puzzle. It's a mystery. Why did this happen? Even if you know who did it, mm. why did they do it? What were the sort of social or political or cultural aspects feeding into that crime? Because one of the things with Red Handed is we go all over the world and it's fascinating to see the wide variety of different crimes that occur depending on the country that you're in, what's more prevalent. There's just so many facets to it. I think true crime is such a great encapsulation of society and human nature as a whole. And I think that's why the general obsession with it anyway, especially from the point of view of women, I would say. <laughs> so did you and Hannah sit down and go, we're going to do a podcast, what should we do it about? Or did you did you come it from the other side, which is, hey, we both love true crime, we should do a podcast about this? What was the yes. process? It was definitely the latter. Um, but one quick point about Hannah and I is that three and a half years ago, we were very busy not knowing each other. Hannah and I are not sort of childhood friends. Lots of people think that's surprising. If you go back and listen to very early episodes, um, I think there is an episode where I say, oh, my birthday's in October. And Hannah goes, your birthday's in October. My birthday's in October. And people listening were like, how do you not know when your birthdays are? And people think that we've known each other for decades we haven't we met at a party at hannah's house that i was invited to by a friend of mine who was living with her and i just went along i got quite drunk hannah was quite drunk we met there we started talking actually about the murder of uh, jean benet ramsey which is a very famous case yeah. out of the us um yeah. for those of anybody listening who doesn't know um and we i think three years ago it was very rare especially in the uk to meet other people who were listening, not just to podcasts, but who were listening to the very specific true crime podcasts that Hannah and I were listening to. And it was just a bit of a light bulb moment. None of my other friends were listening to podcasts. And after a few drinks, we were like, we could do this. We could possibly even do this better than these. Because a lot of the podcasts we were listening to were male fronted podcasts as well. And we thought we've got a completely different perspective. Although we respect these hosts so much and what they do and their grind and the research they do, we've got a different take on some of these cases that they don't approach it from because why would they? They're not women. So that was kind of the basis of why Red Handed started. But we didn't start with a known brand. We didn't know what we were really trying to achieve. We just thought we're both good talkers. We seem to get on well um, and we like true crime. And it was just complete luck that we have the kind of chemistry that we do have. Yeah, just absolute luck. And before you did this, had you done anything like this before? Like, were you in broadcasting or, or anything? Absolutely not. Never. Uh, I did my degree and my master's in economics. Did not think I was ever going to do anything other than possibly go work in finance. Uh, I did that straight out of uni and I hated it. It wasn't for me at all. And then I actually went into producing conferences. So I had a really good time doing that. It was like an everyday MBA. It was so strenuous. I got to travel loads. Um, and Hannah was working in commercial theatre in London. She was working on the Motown show. Um, and then, yeah, we just kind of met, started the podcast and then Thankfully, last year, both of us were able to go full time on the show and never looked back. I wouldn't so do anything else now. this is your full time now. gig. <laughs> we it are makes money. Now. I know you have you have commercials and you have sponsors yeah. and you you um you have what what do you do you call them sponsors? The people who like uh, the subscribers. That's what I'm looking for, isn't it? I guess we would call them because we've got the. I guess our two streams of revenue would be um, we work with Acast, who are our platform, and they do the monetization of the show through ads and sponsorships and things like that. And that comes mainly through the number of listens we get. It gets monetized like a few pennies per one of those. But then the main source of revenue that we are currently so grateful for is Patreon. So Patreon. we work through there and the patrons that we have on there. It's like a to anybody who doesn't know, it's a subscription model that creators can use. And we add uh, Patreon only exclusive content onto that platform. And then if people want to, they can subscribe to it on a monthly basis. The more money they give, the more content they get. So it's completely, um, you know, a free market situation over there. And uh, yeah, that has just enabled us to really get there very much faster, like financial stability wise. And yeah, we are now proud full time podcasters which i never thought i would say of this one podcast red hand of this one from podcast, what, so it's not like yes. you've got a pop just this this one podcast is wow that's and how and, long did it take to get to that point 
I think uh, it, well, it took us two and a half years to yeah. get to that point. Yeah. I know what we like to say is um, <laughs> it feels like we were in labor with a very difficult baby for about two and a half years. It was just, it was crushing the workload, to be honest, because I think one of the, I wouldn't say it's a mistake. Um, we probably wouldn't have done it had we known better at the time, but our naivety led us to decide it was going to be a weekly podcast. We were going to release an hour long episode every single week. And uh, we did not realize just how difficult that was going to be when we started the research, the scripting, the recording, the editing. And bearing in mind, Hannah and I are completely self-taught editors. We yeah. did not know anything about audio editing at all whatsoever. We used to record under a cupboard under her stairs with a shared 10 pound mic. The audio quality was atrocious. We have grown leaps and bounds since then, I'm grateful to say. Um, but yeah, it was just so difficult because we both had incredibly uh, demanding full-time jobs as well. So yeah. what were we thinking? I don't know. But uh, every time we would think about stopping, uh, something amazing would happen. And uh, we just felt like, no, let's just do one more month and see how it goes. Something and amazing like what would happen? Just um, an amazing, we would get, it's at the start, it was just something small, like an amazing review. We would right. get an amazing oh, review. Oh, I see. Great. Yeah. yeah or someone would just, you up. Yeah. yeah, or just someone would comment on a, the Facebook group or the, or the Instagram and say, you guys completely changed my opinion of that case, or I'm so glad how you were able to advocate for that particular victim or something that was the purpose with why we were doing this show. And then it would become, oh, hey, we got a better sponsorship deal this month. Did you see that invoice? That was great. Let's keep going. And then then we got picked up by ACAS quite quickly. And it just, it was always something there to pull us back in. And uh, now, yes, and we've even managed to hire somebody now who helps with the editing. So it's just, it's just amazing. It's what just amazing. What a success amazing. story. That's brilliant. That really is good. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> and the people who listen and subscribe, do you track where they're from in the world? Yes, we do. We're fast. Well, I particularly am just absolutely obsessed with data constantly. Okay. I want more data. If I could get more of it, I would love to. Um, but at the moment, what we do know is, as I said, sort of 80% of our listeners are women. Majority are actually in the US. Yeah, so, I got the feeling from listening to it that you you kind of you over explain things for US listeners now and again yes, in case they're yes. not picking up on the the, the British. It's got to be done, I think. Otherwise, I think you just risk alienating what is our majority listener base, which is the US. Um, yeah. So 60% of our listeners also come from the US um, and about 20% also come from the UK. We've got really good uh, numbers in the UK and Ireland, which is fantastic to see because, you know, it's it's our home crowd. We want, we want more people in the UK listening to podcasts. That is something that we really, really want to advocate for and grow. And then after that, it's like Australia, Canada, and then mainland Europe and then we have quite a few listeners in Asia as well but it's a bit more fragmented there so majority is US which is uh, not wholly surprising yeah it is uh, they were a little bit ahead of the curve on podcasting I'm not sure yeah. why I, I wonder if it was because when podcasting first started going a lot of the British podcasts were dominated by the BBC well, yes. Mind you, having said that, in the US it was PBS. It did a you know, pretty this good job true. of getting it out there yeah. as well. So maybe that, I don't know what the thing was, but they just seemed to take to it and get it and understand it quicker and, and, and better than we did at the very beginning. I think it's evening out now. But, you're uh, really you're you're so right. I think uh, I don't know the answer for, as to why, but uh, yeah, it was just I think following on from particularly serial, which seemed to be the yeah. the thing that really kickstarted podcasting as a craze. The US are just so much further ahead. I do agree with you that it is evening out, but I remember when I first started my podcast um, with Hannah, I was still working, and I was working in a, in the city. I was working in London. I was working with the average age of my company or my team was probably about 25. People were like, what's the podcast? Yeah. When I would tell them that this is what I was doing on the side, and I was shocked because I was like, you are meant to be listening. You're meant to be the audience, and you're asking me what a podcast is. Like, yeah, I really hope that we see the, that continued growth in the UK with podcasting because when I do get people like my friends into podcasting, they're blown away. They're like, what do you mean? There's hours and hours and hours of fantastic content that I can get for free on any topic I want. And I'm like, yeah, it's there. It's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and it's pretty easy to get now as well with the, um, well, the Apple one on the iPhone is, is pretty easy. I don't know yeah. what it's like, what the Android experience is like, but it's 
got to be getting easier, hasn't it? I hope so. And I think now that you have um, sort of more players entering the space, like we see Spotify making huge moves towards like uh, really Joe dominating. Rogan. Goodness me. Yes, Joe Rogan. 100 million, um, they reckon. Oh, God. It's just, I, I never tire of telling people that fact, all of my friends. I'm like, do you know how much Joe Rogan signed for that exclusive deal with Spotify? Um, and other podcasts too, like I love Last Podcast on the Left. Um, they were the ones that Hannah and I really bonded over. They've gone exclusive with Spotify now, and they are one of the biggest podcasts in the US. And I was like, yeah, uh, Spotify are serious um, about podcasting and about uh, trying to take over this space. So I don't know. Who knows what will happen? We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I think you're right about Serial changing it as well, even though, you know, I listened to Serial and I liked it. And I liked the production values of it. And I liked the way the story was told and the way that they used the audio and the interviews. But I was very disappointed at the end. It didn't actually go anywhere. I know. I think this is the thing that, um, especially as a true crime podcaster, I get. People's experience is always, I don't want a mystery. I don't want it to be left unsolved. I want you to give me the definitive answer. And I think the biggest thing Hannah and I come up with is that. And the thing we always say is, Sarah Koenig, what she does is investigative journalism. I'm like, we're not even investigative journalists, guys. We're just storytellers. We're just telling you this story with our own opinions thrown in. And while I agree, I do think that people always say, I don't like a mystery. I like a concluded case. Um, I like a definite answer. Our data, coming back to the data, doesn't prove that. It absolutely proves people love the contentious cases. Did he do it? Didn't he do it? Did she do it? Didn't she do it? Who did it? What's the mystery here? And I think maybe it's just because people get to have um, get to have more of that interactivity. And I do think, actually, people people pretend like they don't like a mystery, but I think that they secretly do. That's my theory anyway. (laughs) What I like about your podcast is it's not like listening to something made by PBS or whoever about, say, the same subject. Because, you know, podcasts, there are podcasts that have covered the same cases that you do. But yours is very, shall we say, real. Oh, I'm going to come out and say it. It's very sweary. So we are it's so, very it, it's so so the two of you you'll be debating a, a motive for instance and it'll really get quite heated and when I first listened to it that really took me back and then I thought <laughs> then, then I thought no no this is this is this is real and I think that's what that's what you've done um, which is unique and and obviously people like it now you know. I don't know if I was approaching, and I don't know whether it's because I've had years in broadcasting, if I was approaching a podcast about true crime, I wouldn't even think to make it sweary. <laughs> so so how did you get there? Again, Graham, I would just say none of this was planned. None of our uh, now brand was sat down and thought out. I think we sat down and thought out what our brand was um, and like what the elevator pitch for our podcast was about a year and a half into making the show and it already being live. And uh, I think the sweariness, um, the realness, which this that is what we want Red Handed to be. We want it to feel like, um, yes, we're discussing the political, the cultural, the social, the, the real legal sides of a case. And we go into the research. We spend hours and hours and hours doing the research. We take it very seriously. But we still kind of want it to feel, I guess we kind of want it to feel like, for some reason, you're hanging out at the pub with your mate who just happens to know for some inexplicable reason, this case in an immense amount of detail, and they're telling you about it over a pint. That's what we want it to feel like. And uh, we we want it to feel casual and so people can follow along. But I think because we are real and because the sweariness, once you get over that, I think some of the Americans at the start found it a bit hard because they are a less sweary folk than we are, I would say. But I think once they do get over that, we want it to feel like it's just your potty mouth friend who loves talking to you about murder every time you see them. And uh, yeah, I, I guess it's just worked somehow, but none of it was pre-planned. It's just come out in a very authentic way um, because Hannah and I just turned on a mic and we thought, let's see what happens. And that is the tip I would give to anyone who wants to start a podcast. Don't over-engineer it. Don't overthink it. Don't sit down and try and think of a plan Um when you're first starting the beauty of podcasting is the barriers to entry are so low you don't need to be a broadcaster you don't need someone to you know send a 
send a sample of your recording to somebody and for an executive somewhere to say, yes, that's the voice of tomorrow. Let's get them in. You can just start and you've got nothing to lose. Buy a cheap mic, get yourself a cheap hoster. And then if it fails, give up. But maybe don't. Just try tweak it. And uh, I think that's what we did. Um, Just do it would be my advice for sure. Yeah, I think of of podcasting. It's like the it's like the punk version of broadcasting. It's like when <laughs> it's like when in the seventies, you know, they say punk was a real. I don't know what what the real answer is, and but it's all like revisionist history now. But people who who were amongst it and in the scene were saying that punk was a reaction to the 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 prog rock and you know these huge. Yeah. <laughs> Emerson, Lake and Palmer and Yes and all that. And and this was more, you know, punk was very homemade. It was right back to three chord, you know, and just yes. loud and energy and all that. And I think that's what podcasting really is because radio, radio was really kind of, I'd like, if I was trying to be kind to radio, I'd say radio's lost its way, but radio hasn't, doesn't know where it's going. So it, it, it hasn't lost its way. It doesn't know where to go. It, it has become so, a lot of radio has become so cliched and so phony, you know, today's best music mix and the number one hit music station yeah. and the news at the top of the hour and the pips and, the, and it's just all so corny now. Whereas podcasting has, and, and particularly yours has just come along and just gone, Wah! you know, <laughs> so, do, do you get that feeling too? Does, like, can you listen to can you listen to regular broadcasting now without thinking? Well, this is a joke. Why do they all have to have at ten o'clock in the morning? Guess the year. Why do they all have to do that? You know, this is just, you don't have to do that. Yeah, I think you're so right, and I think uh, I hadn't thought about it like that. But uh, you're completely right. Like, I personally don't really listen to the radio anymore unless I'm in the car with my mum, and she loves listening to Three Counties Radio for some reason. Right. But uh, I think you're right. It is that. Uh, people just consume media in a very different way now. I yeah. even think if you look at streaming services, but even if you just look at YouTube, they don't have to be high production quality videos that are pulling in millions and millions and millions of views. It's just one person with a webcam talking directly to this audience. And I think the rise of YouTube in that way has really prepped people for a more organic, more authentic maybe less polished version of what they were used to. Podcasting may have not worked a few years ago when it would have been perhaps deemed as not being high production. And don't get me wrong, I do enjoy a very high produced podcast like the BBC Deliver, uh, like Serial Was, like those more serialized long form podcasts. But they don't, uh, there's a reason that they're short, that they are uh, limited series. They're the 10 episodes. I'll listen to them. I'll really respect it. But if you want me listening week in, week out, I need to have a vibe with that host. I need to feel like there is something authentic and real and almost like they become your friend. Yeah. Because that's how I discovered podcasting. I was traveling on my own um, for a, a year and there was only so much music and so many sort of stagnant things that I could listen to like the radio without feeling like I was going crazy I wanted something to replace the friends maybe that I didn't have because I was traveling solo and that's when I discovered podcasting and I was like I don't feel at all like I've just been on a 10-hour bus because I just did it with some of my friends in my ears and I think yeah I think the podcasting is the future um but I think the great thing about podcasting is it's not restrictive So the BBC have their niche, The Guardian doing their thing. You have the high production quality ones that are happening. But at the same time, like I said, there isn't, um, we don't have to wait for permission for somebody somewhere in a boardroom to decide, oh, we need more diverse voices. We need this kind of voice. We need this kind of story. If you have a story, you have a voice and you have a laptop, you can make your voice heard. And I think that that's just proof that diverse voices are what people want. and I think that it's a beautiful thing. I think yeah, it's great. I think, I think that's why I, I think, love podcasting. I think particularly in commercial radio, um, the people running it didn't realize that people want interesting people. Uh, I'll, yeah. You know, I came through radio. Radio is the commercial radio. Being a commercial radio disc jockey is the only job in the world. And I said this to Jonathan Brandmeier, who's a legendary broadcaster in Chicago is it's the only job in the world where you are paid to talk but constantly told to shut up they you know the more music less talk thing they they decided they just de- well they got because what happened was they hired a load of people who weren't very interesting people 
who had not, and these people had nothing to say. And then they did some research and the listeners, the research came back, surprise, surprise, tell them to shut up and just play the music. Well, that shouldn't have been a surprise when you hired really boring people. And so radio got this idea that talk is bad and started stripping all the personality out of radio. And now radio is like so, commercial music radio is so bland. The idiots outside, bre- breakfast radio is still okay. But outside breakfast, the, the, the bland idiots with nothing to say. That's why they read so many texts. They've got nothing to say themselves. They love it when there's a, someone else's opinion they can read out because they never thought of that. So it became just so bland and so boring. Yeah. So all these people who said, no, people don't want talk, people don't want talk, people don't want talk. And then Rogan gets a hundred million from Spotify because he's an interesting person and he has interesting guests. People have always wanted to connect with interesting people. And the mistake radio has been making for years as it slowly kills itself is it keeps hiring boring people who do as they're told and don't make any waves. And people don't want that. If people wanted that, podcasting wouldn't exist. And you know, you and Hannah getting really deep into a case, you're not just giving out the facts, you're giving out your opinions, you're debating different things. And it's, that's, that's what it is. And it's a shame radio can't let, see, you and Hannah should be running a radio station and telling these, <laughs> you, well, you've proved it, you know, in two and a half years, you're now making money from one show a week. Whereas yeah. these people are trying to make money running, there were more redundancies this week because they can't run a thing that's on the air 24 hours a day and everybody's got access to it. They don't have to find it. With podcasting, there still is a little bit of work to finding it. And they need people like you to show them how it's done because not only have they lost their, they haven't lost their way, they don't know where they're going. They, they've, they've got this medium and they don't know what to do with it. So it's so it's great really that sad. you've got your podcast going and you've worked it out and you worked it out without being told what to do because the people who tell you what to do in radio by and large haven't got a clue anyway so you did really well there you've landed in the right (laughs) place on your own thank you graham that's really nice of you today and i I, um, I really i really do sarudi i really admire you the go just going out there and just doing it but I, I mean, that's you, it. Know, you know, if we I weren't tried to do it to anybody, I think that was yeah. why I think, you know, we were, we never sense, we censor ourselves. We do. And so while what we put out feels very, uh, you know, it is, it, none of it is rehearsed. We are scripted, but because there are a lot of facts, there is a case. We do have to tell the, the timeline of the actual story, but everything else that you hear is just me and Hannah as if, as you and I are talking now, but we do listen to it several times before it's released and we say you can, we can't say that let's take that out i don't think that's on brand what let's kind of stuff out. comes out what how bad does it have to be to come out of red-handed i think <laughs> i think it's not so much that it's bad it's that because we try not to censor ourselves when we're recording yeah. we listen back to it and say i don't know where i was going with that point i feel like it's distracting from the story yeah. i feel like i didn't think that that point through um and usually what we do is when we take stuff out we've already corrected ourselves so it will we will realize organically as we're recording and say uh, no what i mean is this and then we'll just we'll just phrase it in a way that that previous bit can be cut out and it still makes sense. Because what we don't, we have built um, a specific brand for ourselves that we don't have to try that hard to maintain because it is authentic. The things that we're saying, the things we're advocating for, whether it is about, um, you know, we, we don't, there isn't a single case that we would be scared to take on. I guess that's a way to put it. So whether it is about racism, whether it's about institutional homophobia, whether it's about marginalized communities or corruption or things like that, I just feel like I, I feel like we can we can tackle any subject in a way that we feel proud of. And if people disagree with it, that's okay because it's just our opinion. Uh, don't get me wrong, we have looked up several times uh, libel uh, and how to avoid being sued and things like this were the things that we're saying um but generally speaking we it's our opinion so we don't have shareholders we don't have anybody a a ceo watching over us watching the money and how it's going to be impacted in fact we've made a cognizant decision that if we're just real and authentic and say what we say the people who love us will find us and they'll support the show and that's what we've been lucky enough has and the people who complain 
it's not for them, which is another exactly. problem with, with broadcasting. This was something I talked to John Holmes about when he was on this show. And, you know, he he is down in broadcasting history in Britain for having the highest Ofcom fine. It was, uh, it was reduced to £75,000. It was originally uh, twice that. But they reduced it as long as they, as long as the radio station fired him. That got one complaint, and it got one complaint. He was on Virgin at night, and it got the the issue was it was this one complaint was from an old lady who listened by accident, whereas the show wasn't <laughs> wasn't for her. Yeah. So exactly. why take any notice of that? And only one complaint. Well, the good thing is you can go because I used to have arguments with radio station bosses, and they'd say, "Oh, this somebody's complaining." And I'd go, "Well, tell them not to listen. It's not for them, obviously. <laughs> if they're listening to the." But you, you've got that. You can go, well, we'll do it for the people who like it, the yeah. people who are into it, the people who are into the style of it and, and the subjects. We, but the people who aren't into it, who wouldn't like it, we're not going to worry about them. That's Absolutely. very healthy. That's exactly how we think about it. In fact, in the very early days when we started the show, we did, when you have smaller numbers and then you have people complaining because you're, you're still trying to find your niche, you're starting to find, find out how, what your voice is going to be. Yeah. And when people would complain, we'd be like, oh, maybe we did go too far, maybe we shouldn't have said that. But then we quickly realized we're, we're making this show for people, but we're also making it for ourselves. Yeah. And now I feel like, I don't know, this sounds really corny, but whenever we do an episode of Red Handed, even if it means I have to stay up, pull three all-nighters in a row to get the research to the point that I'm really happy with, it always feels worth it because once that episode is out there that week, that is like a work of art as far as I'm concerned for the work that we put into it. And that's now there forever. Yeah. So I'm willing to um, do whatever it takes to get that out to the quality that we want it. And if people complain these days about something we've said and about opinion we had, I really, I'm happy to respond to them with a list of podcasts that I can recommend that they should go listen to instead. Yeah. Because these are podcasts. Here's a list of podcasts that are inoffensive. They're not going to give you their opinion. They're not going to force their political, lefty, liberal opinions down your throat. They're just going to tell you the facts. And you should go listen to them to avoid being offended. If you're going to listen to a show that is not just the facts, but is um, presented by two women with opinions, then I think you should accept the risk that that entails that you may be offended because I accept the risk that that throwing my opinions out there entails that I may get backlash. So we all have to accept that risk in this world that we live. So if it's not for you, please don't listen. That's so okay with me. <laughs> well, you said you're you're very big on reading the data of yes. you know the numbers of of uh, Patreon, the the numbers of, of downloads, and the countries they're in and everything. Does looking at that affect the way you approach the show? If like if you have a show on a particular topic that gets bigger numbers, do you then go, We need more of this? Or do you do you, yeah. do you try and drill down and find out <laughs> what the secret source is? I do. I think it's a combination. So I wish that we had enough just purely quantitative data that I could use to really understand what uh, sort of our consumer's behavior is. But um, unfortunately, the data that we do have access to, like, for example, like I'm sure, you know, Apple Podcasts, we don't even know how many subscribers we have. We don't even know really what's happening in that world. We don't understand how the algorithm works. So many questions. But what we do see through ACAST is kind of listenership numbers, uh, the urgency as well with which people listen. So how quickly in the space of how many days do we hit certain milestones? So while generally our episodes tend to even out, so that's a good thing. So people are clearly listening to an episode. But what I love to see is in five days, how many numbers, how many downloads has it hit? And I can sort of tell the urgency with which people listen to that episode makes it to me a more hot episode or a yeah. more hot topic yeah. but we really depend as well on the anecdotal data so i we are on all the social medias we watch obsessively for people's feedback how excited people are when we put an episode out and that does vary hugely so we've tried to be a bit more sort of risk-taking because i think if we don't take risks and try new types of episodes we're never going to know what works and what doesn't yeah. so for example um a risk we took a few years ago was starting to do more current cases Predominantly before that, we had done cases that were adjudicated. They were 10 years old or so, and it was safe to talk about it at that point because everybody had spoken about it already. But one of the few cases, one of the cases that we did um, that was quite recent very early on was when the Charleston shooting, Charleston Church shootings happened in the US um, with that white supremacist Dylan Roof. We did it 
as soon as he was um, convicted, because I was like, I want to get this out there. We've got something to say. It's in the news. We have an we have a voice to bring to this. Yeah. So that was a big risk because we were like, this has the dust hasn't settled on this case. But to see people messaging us from the US saying, as a black person in the US, I didn't know if I could listen to this. I didn't know if you guys would handle this properly, only because you don't know. But or I don't know how much you know. But then after listening to it. I am so moved. And to hear that message again and again, it meant so much to us and it gave us that confidence. So it wasn't just the numbers, it was the actual anecdotal feedback of people saying, you guys nailed this. Then after that, we were like, let's go for it. And so we just started to delve into more and more recent cases. We picked up controversial cases that for some reason other people hadn't covered. For example, the Ian Watkins case, the Last Prophet singer. Yeah. Why? I mean, it's a horrific case. It was a baby who he assaulted, he, he abused, wasn't it? It was, for anyone yeah. that doesn't know, he was a convicted paedophile, but it was like really, really sick. I mean, the age of it's the victim. It's horrific. Was, yeah. It's horrific. Um, and basically, I had to sit and read the court um, documents for that case, a lot of which wasn't reported by uh, reported on by newspapers because I think there is a line where things are too much for people and uh, we pulled out the bits that I wanted to say and I said to people don't go read it you can very easily find it but don't go read it obviously they all went and read it and they were absolutely horrified but I think um, they respected the way in which we approached it and I think we just try to we're not doing it for the sensationalist because we leave out the sensationalist information if you really want to go read it you can but I'm not here to create that kind of podcast but I think um, that fear has now gone so we're happy to cover anything and everything there isn't a single case that we would feel scared to talk about and that's a very refreshing place to be in now i think is is that one the the lost prophets one is that the most shocking one you've dealt with good question i think it was maybe the most shocking one that people listen to because it wasn't one that had been covered by a lot of other podcasts or a lot of other shows. There isn't even, there's like a 20 minute documentary out there on it, but it's more like a news, um, a news special rather than a fully produced documentary. And I think people just didn't know the extent to how bad it was and not just the abuse, but also, um, the way in which it was dropped, uh, there were just so many of so many of the victims fell through the sort of safeguarding net. It wasn't picked up by social services. Um, how the police didn't sort of follow through on certain leads they were getting, and it was kind of that um, ineptitude, unfortunately, on the safeguarding side of it, as well as the hor- horrors of the abuse, that just really, really shocked people because I think they just didn't know. They didn't know how bad it was. Yeah. yeah. Have you touched anywhere there is a lot of speculation now, and if. If we go here, we'll have to be very careful. The Madeleine McCann case, have you touched that one? Yes, we did. Um, okay. so for well, the we're longest not getting time. either of us into trouble. Because <laughs> this, cause remember, this gets broadcast on the radio, so we have yeah. the, the broadcasting regulations as well as the law sure. of the land to worry about. But what is your take on that whole thing? So for the longest time, I will admit, um, I didn't want to cover the Madeleine McCann case because... Um, Firstly, I think it gets a lot of coverage, and Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of victims out there who don't get anywhere near the amount of uh, press coverage, so we wanted to focus on those victims, but it was one we got asked to talk about all the time, and unfortunately, my opinion was not particularly favourable for the longest time towards the McCanns, but then... We broke, we finally said, okay, guys, we will do it. But we, what we did is uh, we, were, we were scared of the litigious yeah. nature behind it. Yeah. So we, we put the, we put, we did it as a live stream. So like this, uh, but we did it behind a paywall. And we said, if you guys want to watch, you need to, you need to like come behind the paywall. We're going to do it there. We just feel a bit safer. But I made that decision prior to doing my research really in depth into the case. And when we came to talk about it, I think bad decisions were made but I do not think that the McCanns were involved right. in the disappearance of their daughter, Madeleine McCann. I think that it was, um, I think, you know, you can look into it as other children in the area were going missing at a similar time, similar ages. Um, so people do talk about whether there was some sort of organized crime going on there because sex trafficking is, I don't think people realize how bad child sex trafficking is. It is 
absolutely off the charts. And I think people would be horrified if we realized just how terrible it is um, a situation right now. Um, so that really comes from sort of organized crime. And then you would have the lone offender who is stalking, who's casing the family. They were there for a week before Maddie went missing. Um, so really for me, it came down to it's either the organized crime or it's the lone um, attacker. There's arguments either way, um, but I would tend towards the lone um, the lone abductor purely because um, I think an organized crime, organized group would have known how high risk a victim like Maddie McCann is to take and to exposing your organization and your criminal activities because of who she was, the fact that she was um, a white child from a wealthy family on holiday in Portugal. I think they possibly wouldn't have been stupid enough to take her. But I, 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 one thing I am sure of now is I do not think that the McCanns had anything to do with her. Okay, because a lot of people aren't so sure, are they? But uh, I agree, and I do think that is a very common thread uh, of thought. The thing is, I think we see it in so many cases where people think, well, they're not behaving exactly how I think I would behave in that scenario, and therefore I think that they're guilty or they're hiding something. The thing I've learned during Red Handed is that people just behave very bizarrely when they're in yeah. grief. And just because they're, they're odd, they behave? I mean, the nutty professor is the one, is, is the classic one. And if you go, go way, way back, Lindy Chamberlain um, in, yes. in Australia was Absolutely. another one where most of Australia was convinced. Some of Australia still convinced she was Absolutely they are, definitely. Yeah. And I think that one of the biggest learnings for me through this podcast has been um, it massively increased my empathy levels to understand people um, in a much better way. And I think one particular case jumps out uh, to me massively. We did a case, I don't know if you've ever heard about this. It was in the US and it was about a man called Stephen Pladel and uh, a, a woman called Katie Pladel. I'll give you a very quick rundown. It's probably one of our more shocking cases actually, that's very unknown. So Stephen Pladel had a daughter when he was very young, when he was like 19, 20. The daughter gets given up for adoption. She grows up with another family family somewhere else. Then when she's an adult, she goes looking for her biological family. She meets her mum and dad, who are still together, Stephen Pladel and his uh, wife. Um, she moves in with them. She has a very intense connection with them. Her and Stephen start a sexual relationship. Uh, so her, his biological daughter and him. And he's like now 40, she's 20. It's a very big mess. She gets pregnant, they run off, they get married. Yes, um, I had to do a lot of digging into the incest laws in every state in the US. It's it's a whole lot. It's a whole thing. And uh, spoiler, he eventually ends up murdering her. So it is, um, it's horrific. It's a horrific case. We've done an hour long episode if anyone's interested. Um, but the natural reaction is, ugh, what? This is sick. They're sick. But then I did a huge just rabbit hole deep dive into this thing called genetic sexual attraction, which apparently it is super, super, super common. There's something like almost 40% of um, adoption reunions as adults between biologically related adults results in at least one of them having intensely sexual relation, uh, sexual feelings towards the other. And in very rare cases, it's reciprocated and it's like this unstoppable thing. And I think reading into that just gave me such a, a different way. When we talked about it, I was like, we could sit here and be like, uh, but let's try and understand why these people were feeling this way. And I think people really took on board with that and had a lot of empathy for Katie and for um, the situation that she was in. So I think, yeah, that's been one of the biggest learnings. But I think coming back to what we're talking about with Lindy, we covered the Peter Falconio case yeah. uh, a few weeks ago when yeah. uh, Channel 4 did the big Murder in the Outback documentary. Because she release. acted funny as well, didn't she? Again, people were like, she did it. Look at her. Look how cold she's being. I would say, okay, strip away your feelings about not liking Joanne Lees because she's not crying in the way you think you would if this was you. Let's look at the facts. Where has this woman who is barely a woman, she was so young at that point. And I was like, she, who's never been to Australia before, you're telling me she got rid of a body in the middle of the outback, where is the body? And all of the stuff about the footprints, there's just such a mess. It was the same police force, the Northern Territory Police, who messed up the Lindy Chamberlain case. Yeah. They did it again, the, the police work. Basically, the thing that I think with the, um, with the Peter Falconio case is Joanne Lees, she, her story doesn't make sense yeah. based on the physical evidence that is found. But does her story not make sense 
because of the and match with the physical evidence found because she's lying or because the police messed up the physical evidence so badly yeah, it was that contaminated, she is in fact wasn't it a lot of it so yeah. badly contaminated they walked all over the scene and then they said they couldn't find any footprints and it was like of course you couldn't because you walked all over the scene it's it's a it's a whole mess and also secondly she was through one of the most horrific experiences that anyone could possibly go through if she's telling the truth which i do think she is do you not think they would have pumped her full of Valium so that they could just roll her out to press conferences? Of course she's not acting like you would expect a normal person to act. Like, she, if you look at her, she looks like somebody who is shell-shocked, somebody mm. who is possibly on Valium to calm her down. I think without the whole story, people jumping to conclusions, which is something I used to do all the time when I was just a casual true crime consumer, it just... We are not very good as humans at detecting lies or detecting deception or detecting human behavior in terms of people um, making up stuff. I think you've just got to look at the evidence and uh, all of this kind of, oh, look, she's looking to the left. She's looking up to the left. She must be lying. Is just, it's not something I put much stock in and nor do we at Red Handed. <laughs> I think uh, some of the problem could be that people are not brought up on true crime. Yeah. They're brought up on movies, which is mm -hmm. untrue crime. Yes. And so if you're not acting the way that the innocent people act in the movies, then you're not innocent. Absolutely. Just been, you know, you that's, have. That's... You've been conditioned to think that's it. And I think one of the most uh, interesting things that Serial points out very early on in the podcast is this idea that we have found repeated again and again in stories we've done. Innocent people accidentally make themselves look far more guilty than a guilty person because a guilty person is ready they're ready with yeah. answers they're ready with an alibi they're ready with a story for where they were that day they will tell you in fact one of the ways to spot if someone is lying is are they giving you too many details are they telling you a story in chronological order things that the police will do is actually ask somebody to tell the story in reverse because somebody who's lying will find it more difficult because they've practiced it in a certain chronological order, for example. Um, and I think innocent people, they don't have a cover story. They don't know where they were six weeks ago on a Tuesday because where was I, where were you going six weeks ago on a Tuesday? I don't know. Yeah. Like what? Who a little knows? bit easier to tell after, after lockdown. <laughs> I know, during lockdown. Pre-lockdown, pre not a chance. Not yeah. a chance. And I think this is why. And I think even looking at the uh, serial case, I don't think Adnan Saeed, killed uh hey Lingman. i don't think that he did that i think it's a it's a real travesty of um justice what's ha uh, happened to him and i think that for example with him he was a muslim boy who had, came from a very strict family he was lying probably to cover up what he was really doing mm -hmm. um because his family would have been angry and disapproved and i think the police used that in order to make him look guilty and i think that these kind of things um you have to go far beyond just people's behavior, the stories they tell to real hard evidence. And I think that uh, as humans, we're so quick to pass judgment on people. And that's one of the things that Red Handed, we really want to want to push forward as our message is uh, don't judge them just based on the fact that they're not crying hard enough because someone who's pretending is probably crying very hard because that's it, what they think you want to see. Yeah, yeah, good point. Well, Red Handed, you took it on the road pre COVID-19, the live show. Tell me what happened in the live shows and when they'll be back. Oh, Graham, they were meant to be back this year in a big way. We were so excited. We discovered that we just love being live. We absolutely love it. It's just the biggest rush, the biggest amount of fun we've ever had. And uh, we started slow. We were really like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to uh, speak publicly on this are we going to be able to maintain our authenticity are we going to be able to do this we edit so much as well can we actually do this so we started small with a couple of little shows and then we were like right let's do it we're doing a UK tour we did six cities um, in about three weeks and we just had so much fun seeing people like in front of us like hearing them laugh because we don't hear that we're just yeah. talking into a mic you don't hear people go <gasps> or laugh or gasp or like shout something out at you even and uh, we just loved it it was the best and uh, we were actually meant to do um more touring this year um and it's just not happened so it's all been pushed back into 2021 but we are going to be um headlining at the london podcast festival so that is exciting so we're really wow. excited about that and that is going ahead then? That is, apparently it's 
going ahead. It's a, in about a month's time. They're yet mm. to make the sort of um, official announcements and everything. But uh, yeah, looks like it's going ahead. Fingers crossed in about a month. You'll do a live show from there. So that'll yes. be good. Yeah. Well, that won't be exactly. It well. It'll be, yeah, that'll be more of a other podcasters kind of that might not be as it might not because when no. you did your other ones it was your real fans yeah so. it was it was amazing and actually when you asked what happened at the live show we again because why not why couldn't we just stick to a simple hour and 20 minute show feels like you're going to the cinema you're in and out no our show was about two and a half hours long <laughs> um with the preamble it was about three hours long we were exhausted um but we had so much fun we just did one case like we do on the show we had the visuals we had a slideshow we'd made little videos um before for visual jokes because we normally don't get to do visual jokes which was fun yeah. um the killer we talked about is very tall so that i'm very short so there's a very very funny video of hannah piggybacking me and not piggybacking me meet on her shoulders just walking down the street there's all sorts of fun stuff that happened and we just can't wait to get back on the road hold on a second i'm i'm my sound is going funny oh no and i now I think this lead has given up on me. So oh, no. I, we, we are recording and everything's fine. Okay. It's just I can't hear you. So I'm going to oh. take this and plug it in direct because I think I've got a faulty lead. And if I plug it in direct, which means I'll have to pull it out of my T-shirt. Hold on a second. So, is it, so the lead reaches. So if I stick that in there, I should be back. No, I'm not getting it. I think it could be this. Hold on. I can fix this. I know how to fix this. No worries. I think it's those cheap headphones I got, which uh, actually they were they were worse than cheap. They were free. Ah, uh, I uh, see. Yeah. There you are. Sorry there about that. There we go. Yeah, That's no, what okay. happened? The, 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 this. When I flew back from New Zealand in March, they... Uh, on Singapore Airlines, these are the ones they give you for free. I see. And yeah. you get what you pay for. So there we go. But I'm a fan of reusing. you got to yeah. use it till it breaks. Well, that's what I thought. You know, I thought exactly. it'll, do, it'll do for this. <laughs> so we, we were talking about the live show. And uh, and what, so they, they will you will go on the road again with them, back to like another six cities or whatever it is, as well as being at the, the, the podcast awards, the London, what's it, the London podcast? The London Podcast Festival. Festival, um, okay. Yes. So that's going to hopefully go ahead um, next month, which is be really exciting. We were even scheduled to speak, uh, speak to present, perform, whatever, at a few other um, shows this year, but they've all just been pushed into 2021. We're also, um, fingers crossed, on an international tour uh, going to the US. Wow. Which will be really exciting. Will it um, ever? Goodness yeah. me. It was meant, it was, well, you know, we might as well be honest. It was meant to be happening this year, um, but it's not. Uh, we have, we've called it in enough time that we haven't lost a huge amount of money because the visa is incredibly expensive um, wow. to go. Yes. And uh, so now it's just going to have to wait till next year. So, yeah, we thought even if we went and they allowed it to happen, if even 10% of people don't feel confident enough to come out yet, yeah, it's just going to feel flat. It's our first time going to the US. We probably won't go back for another couple of years if we go. So we just want it to be the best it can be. So it's going to have to wait until next year now. But it's okay. It's Good okay. luck with all that. And what Thank about you? you? I mean, you share a little bit of your life every now and again on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. So, so where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Well, I'm from Hertfordshire. So I grew up in a town called Letchworth. Okay. I mean, no one, like, why? There's no reason to know where it is. No, uh, Let didn't Letchworth have the world's first roundabout? It did. Top facts knowledge grave we do we have the i don't remember i think it might be the uk's first roundabout which i think okay. may actually be the world's first i don't know but we have a big sign on it yeah, i haven't I been see. down there in a while yeah. uh we also have lots of black squirrels which we're very proud of because every single pub here is basically called the black squirrel <laughs> so are you, are you in letchworth right now i am so uh, during that? lockdown came home do you, home, know, do you so... know where i am right now where are you i'm in hitchin <laughs> I didn't know you were in Hitchin. Hitchin is where I live, yeah. Oh, you've, my God. Well, You've probably driven insane. past this block of flats. It's where the old art college used to be. Oh, I know where that is. 
Yeah. That's serious. You've driven so past this very flat. Hey? Yeah. My best friend lives in Hitchin, so I'm there like all the time, coming out there tomorrow for some pub time, which is fun. Well, my wife works That's in, so in Hermitage Road. She works in a in a gift shop called uh, The Herm. Or, no, it's called, it was called Hermitage & Co. I think they're changing the name of it. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. Oh, my God, I didn't know that. Well, that explains why your mum listens to Three Counties Radio, which you mentioned earlier. Mum loves Three Counties, yes. So you grew up in Letchworth. I did. I went to Fernhill. Right. I don't know if you know Fernhill School. No, yeah, no. I grew up in Letchworth. Very, very nice town. Very, like, It's a lovely place. town. And it, it was... It was the, which was it, the Simon Pegg movie where the... Um... Yes, The World's End, they filmed it here. Yeah. <laughs> and in Hitchin, though, because you guys have got a lot nicer and a lot more pubs than we do. So, okay. yeah, it was good. <laughs> yeah. So you grew up in Letchworth. I did. And have then... you always lived in Hitchin? Well, no, I've only been here. Weird thing about is um, I came here to work at Bob FM. And okay. I did the breakfast show and was program director at Bob for a f- for about five years so we've probably been here like seven years now and it was only a few weeks ago i learned something about hitching you'd think if you'd lived somewhere for seven years you'd start learning a few things about hitching but i something came up and i forget what it was and i wanted to mention the queen i I was it was a radio thing and and somebody had asked me a question about something and it was something i got in I, i did on the radio years and years ago and didn't get into trouble for it because it was no I, I I was going down this thing of like I only ever get into trouble on the radio for telling the truth if I say something that's not the truth I don't get into trouble and many many years ago when I was working in Bournemouth did the breakfast show there and it was a silly bit and I shouldn't have done it but I didn't get into trouble for it I announced when the Queen Mother was very much alive I announced that she died and oh. uh, didn't get it didn't get a thing nothing but then I did some other stuff but because which was the truth and it got an all hell broke loose so i was making the point that you know as long as it isn't true you can get away with anything and i wanted <laughs> to say this to somebody and i thought i better look up and find out the date when the queen mother did actually die so i can you know put the thing into context and go like i said it at this date but she didn't mm-hmm. die till her so when i looked when i go have you ever googled the queen mother no i can't say i have if you do, you'll be shocked to find out where the Queen Mother was born. Was it Hitchin? It was Hitchin. Now, how can you... <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, there you go. How can you live seven years in a town? Every taxi driver should tell you that fact. Exactly. How did I not know? I've spent the last... I've spent 25 years in Letchworth, and no. I didn't know the Queen Mother was born in Hitchin. Well, that's, that's why bad. it now makes sense why in Hitchin there is a theatre called the Queen Mother Theatre, where the car park is. I had no idea. How is that not what Hitchin... She, she, I can't get my head round. You know what, Graham? I'm going to text WhatsApp my best friend who lives in Hitchin and ask her if she knows. And then if she replies, I'll just by ask the her. Because I, I did the see. same with my if wife. She... I came. I said, "Where do you think the Queen Mother was born?" And she said, no. "I said I'm not going to tell you. You have to look it up." And she <laughs> went, and she just went, "No way." Yeah. Oh my God! I'm going to ask her and let's see if by the end of uh, by the time we finish recording, she tells me she did know that or didn't know that. But she never mentioned it to me if she does. <laughs> Everybody in Hitchin should know that, shouldn't they? I'm not a royalist, but it's a big deal. I know. How are we never told at school? That's very strange. Very strange. I'm I'm shocked. I'm shocked. Well, right. there you go. Look there at you that. Go. Look at so, that. <laughs> let, let, let's wrap this up by talking about, you've already mentioned one, which was uh, uh, the podcast you listened to. And you mentioned the one, what was it, the one? And I, it's the one next door to the, the... Oh, so... The one that I listen to that is like sort of an ongoing podcast, like weekly, like Red Hand did. I love Last Podcast on the Left. So Last they're Podcast true- on the Left. Okay. The left. So, so tell me yeah. about that. So they're, they're huge. They are absolutely enormous. They're one of the probably biggest true crime podcasts in the US. They're just three guys. Um, they're just, they're very, I guess they were the inspiration for Red Handed because we we liked the very factual podcasts like Case File, like um, the serialized ones like Serial or Dr. Death. There have been so many fantastic ones like that. Uh, but we also love the really chatty, frivolous ones as well that we listen to, the lifestyle podcasts and stuff. And we were like, 
But why couldn't we do the factual with the frivolous? And I think that is what Last Podcast did. They're very comedic. They're very uh, lighthearted. They're very jokey. But they take their research very seriously. So I I like their personalities and I have respect for their work. And that's what we wanted Red Handed to be, where we never drink on the show. I know there's a big trend of, like, drinking while you're chatting on uh, on podcasts. We never do that. We are consummate uh, professionals on the show but uh, yeah it's all very um, that's what we kind of tried to mimic with the show I guess from last podcast but other than that I just I've listened to so many good 10 part 6 part 10 part serialised podcast last year which I would just if you're into true crime I would definitely recommend so I think uh, my two standouts were probably Dr. Death yeah. and um, Root of Evil they just blew me away absolutely phenomenal production so good such good investigative journalism like it's not what we do we are not investigative so i have full credit to them for what they do it was fantastic great all right so what are you looking forward to you're looking forward to getting back on the road yes absolutely we cannot wait that is the next big thing i think at the moment Lockdown's been a bit of a bummer because, like I said, we couldn't do the tour. We couldn't do any live appearances or any live shows, which we really wanted to do, especially coming off the back of the tour at the end of 2019. But I think the the, the blessing in disguise that 2019 has been, uh, 2020 has been is that it's just allowed us to really double down on the show. Yeah. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't do anything else. We couldn't plan any uh, live tours. So we've just given 100% to the show, and it's really paid off. So... Yeah, it's been a solid uh, momentum building year, I like to call it, in our red-handed business meetings. <laughs> and next year you'll be getting the gold award as well, clearly, because the, I uh, hope so. the trend has been I established. Hope so. Well, I hope, so. I hope you have fun in Letchworth and it's great to talk to you. If, you if, we wasn't, if it wasn't for COVID, we could have actually done this in person. I know, I'm uh, so close to you, that's hilarious. <laughs> I had no idea, but uh, yeah, now I know you're in Hitchin. Yeah, so if I ever bump into you in the pub, I'll say hello. Saruti yeah. Bala. Well, is it? Do I, by the way, is it? Do we use your full name, or are you like Madonna? I, there's not many Sarutis in the <laughs> podcasting world, so let's go with Saruti. You know, <laughs> Saruti. Great talking to you. Thank you very much. Has your she friend been great. back in touch about the Queen Mother yet? She hasn't. I'm disappointed. Maybe she's just so shocked that she hasn't been able to muster the strength to reply to my <laughs> message. But uh, <laughs> okay. when you post this, if she does, I will comment below and let you know what she said. Fantastic. Saruti, thank you very much. The podcast is called Red Handed. It's available wherever you get your podcasts and uh, don't miss it. It is unique. It's something else. It's sweary, but it's real. It's authentic. (laughs) And uh, boy, do they talk about some stuff. Really, really is good. Thank Thank you you so much for having me on, Graham.